Last time, we started to explore the potential of FFmpeg outside of video conversion, and well, today we're going to continue along those same lines. Last time, we sort of restricted ourselves to just the filters in FFmpeg. Today, we're going to look beyond that, and we're going to see what other features in FFmpeg makes it all the more powerful. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Today's video comes to you in two parts. First and foremost, how to actually mix multiple video streams and filters together. This alone is extremely powerful and can actually allow you to do many cool things. On top of this, we'll also take a look at some editing features, in particular how to actually make cuts within a video. We'll also look at ways to switch effects on and off over time, and that of course gives you all the more power. Without further ado, let's jump in to take a look at filter graphs, your cool method of stringing together multiple filters. Now, the basic filters we've been using so far can actually be expressed in sort of this graphical manner, you know, the computer science kind of graph, not the math kind of graph. Basically, you have an input video, you stick it to a filter, and well, you get an output. So take for example an actual FFmpeg command, you have an input file, and that of course is your input right here. You put it through an EQ filter, and you get an output. So yeah, fairly straightforward. In fact, if you were to actually string together multiple different filters, it can still be expressed in the same way. If you do EQ, comma, unsharp, then of course EQ happens first, the result is passed over to Unsharp, and Unsharp does its work. So yeah, hopefully that's been pretty intuitive. We're going to basically expand upon this concept to do more complex things. Take for example this sort of messy thing I showed you towards the end of the previous episode. As you can probably recall, I was showing you the Waves filter, and I was actually mixing it onto the original video itself. Clearly, this isn't going to be as straightforward as the filter graphs we've been seeing, so let's actually try and draw this out to get a better understanding. We start from our input video, this of course works exactly as we expect. That actually goes out to a split filter, in which I've actually sort of duplicated a video three times into three different streams. For the first two streams, I've basically generated the waveform using the waveform filter, and I've basically also used a pad filter. And what that does is it creates a whole lot of blank space, displaying the wave itself wherever I actually tell it to. So yeah, as you can see, the result at this point of time is, you know, a wave at the side and a wave at the bottom. The next order of business is to actually combine these two. And I've achieved that using a blend filter. As you can see from the arrows, I've actually taken two video streams and combined it into one. The result is something like this, with the two waves now stacked on top of each other. Turning our attention back to the remaining video stream, well, I pad it out so as to give it some borders towards the left and the bottom. All that's left to do now is to blend everything together, creating the final result. What you see here is an example of, well, a somewhat more complex filter graph. All that's left to do now is to actually turn this into an actual FFmpeg command. Of course, I should mention at this point that if you're going to be using a complex filter graph, you know, one that isn't just a straight line, you are going to have to use the filter complex command switch, and not any of the others we've seen. Now, instead of actually doing the extremely complex example we've looked at, let's actually do something a little bit simpler, and hopefully a little bit more fun. Basically, I have a static image of, you know, the background from the video you've been seeing, and what I also have is a little animation on a green background. This of course means we can actually do chroma keying, or, you know, in other words, the green screen effect, to sort of stack these two videos on top of each other. Let's first actually try to visualize how we're gonna do this. Of course, we have the green video as well as the background, and these two exist as two separate input streams. We're going to take the green video and perform what is known as color keying on it. 
This allows us to generate a keyed version of the video. All that's left to do then is to make use of an overlay filter to actually stick the keyed video on top of the background. So yeah, hopefully that's not too complex. Let's begin by constructing our ffmpeg command call. Notice something that we haven't done before. We've actually now specified two input files, since that is of course what we need. The two input files are the green screen file as well as the background. Then of course we have to specify our complex filter string. Let's tackle the first part and that is doing the color keying. Here you will see the most important thing you need to do when you're actually constructing a complex filter graph and that is to actually name your streams like so. Essentially this is just a color key filter and this is just normal filtering like we've seen previously. However we now include something to its left in square brackets. This in fact tells us which video to actually work with. Zero here actually has a special meaning. You see, the two inputs that are coming in are actually named internally as input zero and input one. Since we want to actually run the color key effects on input zero, well, we have to state it. Of course, when we are done doing this, we want to name the output of the filter as well. And that of course comes at the end. I've called it keyed. And since this is actually arbitrarily defined by me, well, you can actually call it anything. So yeah, as a recap, you're going to have to specify the inputs in square brackets, then the filter name, then the output in square brackets again. So alright, let us move on to do the next part, which is to actually merge the two video streams together. We start off with keyed, which is of course what we've just created, and well, we want to merge that onto the background aka input number one. So here's how we're going to do it. All we have to say is one, which is of course the background clip, then keyed, and then the overlay filter. Notice that since we're dealing with two inputs here, both of these video streams have to be specified before the filter name. You'll also find that the order of these two input streams actually do matter, and the reason for this is because overlay is actually looking to, well, take one of these two inputs and overlay them on top of the other. In this case, well, according to the documentation, it wants the background first and then the overlay to come next. So we do actually have to respect this, which is why I entered them in this particular order. Of course, basically we're done. All we have to do now is to specify the file name and we get our result. Notice that I did not actually name the output stream coming out of the overlay filter. That's because we don't need it. There is an implicit connection on a graph between the last filter and the actual output file. The same actually holds true for inputs. If you only have one input, then you don't actually need to specify the inputs like this. In this case, we are forced to be explicit about which input we are talking about because there are two of them. Of course, in order to get the correct result, I actually had to specify some parameters for the color key filter. So yeah, don't forget your parameters. You can still specify them even if you have a complex filter graph. The result, of course, looks something like this. The chroma keying has been correctly done and the two videos have been stacked together as we would expect. So yeah, those are filter graphs and they are actually what makes FFmpeg so flexible and powerful. Now we've already spent quite a bit of time, so let's move through the next part quickly. We're going to take a look at some simple trimming features available within FFmpeg, as well as how you can actually turn certain effects on and off over time. Let's take a look. FFmpeg has some timeline features, both to control the filters as well as to do some editing. So let's take a look at both of these things. When it comes to using the timeline to control filters, well, you're going to have to actually specify things in a kind of mathy way. Basically, if we want to actually have a blur function that only runs between, you know, the 5th second and the 10th second, you can actually say something like this. You want to enable this filter when t is actually between 5 and 10. And yeah, as you can see, well, it works. Do note that the enable feature isn't actually available in every single filter, but many of the filters actually have it. The things you can actually use in a similar way, of course, include T, which is a timestamp in seconds. 
n, which is the actual frame number, as well as w and h, which are the width and height of the video. If you need to perform comparisons, well, you have access to features like greater than, greater than or equal, less than, or less than or equal. These functions will give you 1 if the comparison is true, and they'll give you 0 if not. Same deal for between, if x is actually between, you know, the minimum and maximum value, then you'll get 1, otherwise you'll get 0. If you want to do more complex comparisons, you can use if and if not. Basically, a test is run against x. In a case of if, we want to make sure that x is not 0. In a case of if not, the evaluation will only become true if x is 0. In any case, if the result is true, y will be returned. Otherwise, z will be returned. Very interesting things can be done. For example, in this command call, which actually comes from the official documentation, what has been created is a transition. Essentially, a blending operation is happening, and the intensity of the blending between A and B, which are the two inputs, actually changes over time. As you can see, there is a dependency on T. Basically, over a period of 4 seconds, one of the two inputs is being faded out, while the other is being faded in. So yeah, this is actually an extremely powerful feature available in FFmpeg. Let's now talk about another editing feature, and that is slicing. In the sample video you've been seeing a lot, what we've actually done is we've made a huge pan across the city skyline of Singapore. Now, let's say I don't actually want the entire pan, I only want this part in which the Marina Bay Sands is actually visible. I've scrubbed through the video and realized that really I only want the footage from the 14 second mark to the 18 second mark. Well, you can of course do this with FFmpeg, and there are several different methods to do so. To actually get to the start time, we use a feature called Seeking. There are actually two ways to do this, Input Seeking and Output Seeking, and their command calls are a little bit different. As you can see in this case, what we've actually done is we've made use of the SS command switch to specify the start time of the video. The only difference between these two command calls is the order in which we do things. In input seeking, we specify the time first, before we specify the input file. In output seeking, well, we specify the time after the input file. Oh, and incidentally, speaking of specifying the time, the format being used here is hours, minutes, and seconds. Of course, since this is a very short video, we don't have to do this, we can simply specify the number of seconds, and FFmpeg understands that as well. Now, don't worry too much about the difference between input and output seeking, I'll talk about that in a minute. For now, let's take a look at how to actually specify the endpoint. As it turns out, there are also two different ways to do this. You can either specify the duration of the final output, or you can actually give an ending timestamp for the encoding to actually stop. The methods to do this are as follows. To give a duration, you simply need to say dash "-t", followed by, well, how long you actually want your video to be. To specify an end time, you're gonna have to say dash "-2", and give, well, the end time. So why are there so many different ways of doing things? Well, as it turns out, there are very good reasons. Let's first talk about using output seeking, and that is when we actually have the seek part of the command, come after the input file specification. What this actually means is, FFmpeg will open the file at the beginning and actually waste time decoding the first 14 seconds while not doing anything. That is why when you actually make the command call, you realize that the command line sort of sits there, apparently idle for a while before it actually starts doing the encoding. The command line isn't actually being idle, it's just basically sitting through the first 14 seconds of the video. The advantage of doing things this way is that FFmpeg knows that this is the 14 second mark. As a result, you can tell it to actually go to the 18th second, and it will know what you want. Compare the behavior we've seen here to input seeking. Now, in input seeking, remember that we actually specify the start point before specifying the input fault. When we do things this way, FFmpeg knows to jump directly ahead to the 14 second mark. 
That of course means we save some time, but there is a tiny drawback, in the sense that FFmpeg actually thinks that, well, the video has started here. It recognizes this as 0 seconds, which is why we can no longer actually say we want to cut to the 18th second. The 18th second is now a completely different place in the video, so that's not going to work. Instead, we are restricted to being only able to specify a duration. In this case, of course, we only want to cut out 4 seconds, which is why we say dash "-t4". So yeah, as a very quick summary of what we've just said, using input seeking is fast, but we're restricted to only cutting by duration. Using output seeking is slower, but we actually have a choice whether we want to cut at a particular timestamp, or if we want to cut by duration, which is still of course accessible. Alright, before we wrap up, let's actually take a look at how we want to join multiple videos together, using what is known as concatenation. Again, concatenation also has two methods, one method using a file list, and one method using a complex filter. Let's take a look at a file list first, essentially your syntax now looks something like this. You have to say dash f concat, and your input becomes a text file containing a list of files, instead of the actual files themselves. Your text file needs to look something like this, every line needs to start with the word file, followed by a file name. There can also be a file path specified here, both absolute and relative file paths will work. The alternative is to actually use a filter. Now, this sort of works, you know, as you would expect. You will have to use the dash i switch to bring in as many files as you need, and then you simply have to use the concat filter, and of course specify the relevant input streams to get FFmpeg to concatenate everything together. You can specify as many inputs as you want, you'll of course have to expand upon your list of input streams, and you'll also have to tell the concat filter how many inputs there are, by actually using the end parameter and setting it to the number. Again, concatenation using these two methods actually have their pros and cons. I feel that the file list method is actually more convenient because you can easily generate a list of files. If you want to use the filter method in a batch context, you are going to have to sort of jump through more hoops to generate a proper command. Unfortunately, the file list method actually has a drawback, and that is in the fact that you do actually have some codec restrictions. In fact, all the files in your file list must have similar codecs before this method can actually be used. Compare this to the filter method, where this actually doesn't matter. However, restrictions still apply across the board. Your input videos actually have to be of the same physical dimensions. There are some other attributes as well that matter, for example, the pixel aspect ratio also matters, and I believe the frame rate also matters as well. So yeah, whatever the case is, concatenation has its fair share of limitations, and you have to make sure that all the restrictions are being followed before actually performing your concatenation. So yeah, if you've ever needed FFmpeg to do something more advanced or more complex for you, well, you've just seen two different tools that can really help you with that. Anyway, with that said, that's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.